we have a historic opportunity unparalleled um, to punish a genocider. Never has this happened. A peaceful deposition of a leader who engaged by her own hands, complicit in genocide in Gaza. This will be a moment in the history of civil rights, human rights globally, that will be recounted again and again. And how will this happen? At the hands of people of conscience who come out, walk gently behind the curtain at the ballot box to speak the truth against the pharaohs in the White House. It is truly a strategy that we have pursued from the very beginning in October when Abandon Biden emerged. Our strategy was to punish the president and now the vice president for her genocide, to take the blame for her defeat, in so doing by power to send a signal to the political landscape that you should never have ignored us and that when you engage in genocide, you lose. Because there's truly a cynical theme that's taking place here, that the Democratic Party, who supposedly stands for values like life, for health care, for equality, for the end of racism, the end of anti-Semitism, the end of Islamophobia, that party that Muslim Americans and their allies, people of conscience, supported in droves and made the president president in 2020. 85 to 90 percent uh, alone of Muslim Americans voted for the president. That party with those policy priorities following, fulfilling the dream for human rights. That's what we thought. And now we see truly cynicism, a cynical attempt to do what? To engage in genocide? To engage in genocide after everything we've learned in our history, segregation, slavery, separation, inequality, uh, Jim Crow, truly this is a moment unparalleled in our history, our tradition, that we should never allow and reward leaders who speak to us and say, I'm going to offer you social security, health care, forgiveness of student debt, climate, uh, fighting climate change, and yet shed blood across the planet. And so what we believe is that since we, in huge numbers, voted for the Democrats, now we have the power to say you should never, ever have engaged in genocide. And because of it, you will lose and history will have a resounding message that when you engage in genocide, your own people will come out and ensure finally your rule will come to an end. Imagine, imagine that we can be the ones to depose the leaders who sit atop a superpower. And so that is the promise that we, we tell our people when I campaign throughout this state and in the swing states where we have operational campaigns from coast to coast. We began abandoning Biden in November. You should have seen how much like we were talking to our community. They were skeptical uh, in the swing states throughout the country. And the major question they asked, the question that came again and again perpetually was, but Trump. And the truth is that when I was living under Trump between 2016 and 2020, I literally closed my laptop. I couldn't hear his grating voice talking about Latino judges and people living with physical disabilities, people living with disabilities, survivors being attacked by him, him spewing racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. We remember Charlottesville and then the insurrection, his COVID denial, his absolute rejection of climate change. This is a person who is despicable. But how could you have had this lifelong Democrat go around, one of the two founders of Abandon Harris, go around to the community and tell them we have to punish Harris, we have to punish Biden? I mean, I, I canvassed for Senator Casey in, in Philly in 2006. I canvassed for Barack Obama in 2008. I cried when Hillary lost. I leapt, I jumped in my living room when the news, Fox News called Arizona for Biden because I knew what that meant. It meant that he won, that he was going to be the president. Why, how could this have happened? How could a community that has suffered Islamophobia at the hands of a candidate despicable like Trump who awaits in the corridors 
to become the president if our strategy, if our strategy wins, if we actually come through, he is the president. How could this have happened? And the following is the reason. In one word, genocide. How could we have come to this point? There is no such thing as a lesser evil. When it comes to genocide, you pass a threshold of no return. That had abandoned Biden from November when we were persuading our community, we would say four years under any Republican is incomparable to one day in Gaza. It's an argument based on sacrifice that we have to tough it out, that we have to struggle. And we are planning right now. Our people are planning the struggle after November 5th. It doesn't end. It just is so emotional because if we were to walk to the ballot box in droves again and reward the vice president, the president, after this horrifying year, what would that mean for the country? It would mean you could do anything. You could even claim that there's a lesser evil where you campaign at our concentration camps. And you would say, well, the alternative would be worse. They don't offer you food in your camp. And that is the absurdity we're in. It's an existential question, no longer a simple political calculation between tax rates, tax cuts, infrastructure plans, healthcare plans that have public options or no public options. We are in a territory that is truly, truly unimaginable. The horror that comes upon a people who then look and they realize, wow, we could send a signal to at least one of the two major parties that you lost because of genocide, for them to take a deep breath, look at the map, and for instrumental reasons, not moral reasons, for instrumental reasons for them to say, we can't do this any longer. We look at the map and we won't, we won't, we won't win Michigan. We won't win Pennsylvania. We won't win in Wisconsin. And therefore we can't win another election. We got to get rid of foreign policies that execute human beings that mean a rain of bombardments upon an innocent people on the verge of disintegration. And this is just Gaza. It's happening across the world at the hands of American policy. Our carnage, a fulfillment of a belief so despicable, so malicious, American exceptionalism must end. At abandon Biden, abandon Harris, we follow the light of Martin Luther King, not just the Martin Luther King that we remember so dearly, who sung those songs, we shall overcome on that Selma Bridge, or who penned a letter from a Birmingham jail telling all people to end the vile segregation that America was drowning in. But we remember the Martin Luther King a year before his assassination, who spoke out against the Vietnam War, a man who knew then, in the 1960s, that American exceptionalism was vicious and that torture, attack, genocide must come to an end at the hands of the American government no longer. Civil rights belong to all people, not just Americans, the last chapter of civil rights. And so we embark, so with sacrifice, seeking an end to our vicious policies, beginning now with Gaza, calling on all people of conscience to join us. A lot of people often uh, ask us, you know, how is it that you're supporting endorsing the Green Party? Are they going to win? And our campaign is a campaign of truth, and I will be completely transparent. We go in this and we endorse knowing that the Green Party has no chance of winning. Then why? Why did we endorse? To show our power to be a credible threat, as I described. But there is another reason a lot of people don't realize, the importance of having a third party. We believe that it is essential to stand away from these two despicable parties and to build from a distance, even if we never win the presidency. Why? Because we can gain leverage and actually compel these parties to shift their policies from that distance by showing that we are galvanizing and mobilizing the community 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, 6 10%. That is incredible. Then we have a base, a headquarters, from which we can actually alter these two parties. 
put them into a competitive bid as they seek to get voters from the Green Party to come in and vote for them. And so it is a strategy of seduction, for, but for it to work, we have to show we have power. We have to stand away. We have to build an infrastructure across this country, even knowing we will never lose, or knowing that we will never win. And so uh, this is really, really critical. Uh, we want to build the Green Party. This is not something that will just die after November 5th. And we want to be sure that we are galvanizing, mobilizing the community in 2025, in 2026, in 2027, and in 2028. And we need people from all backgrounds. And in that party, we will protest, and we will educate, and we will mobilize, and we will use our leverage against the Republicans and the Democrats, and we will go out to the world and tell the world what we're doing so that they know, and that we have alternative policies, and we have a dream of another America. And so this happened. Ross Perot was able to completely alter the landscape. The Democrats and Republicans shifted their policies towards this idea of having a balanced budget. And this is not a primary concern for us at Abandon Harris. We want the policies to end genocide, torture abroad, to bring an agenda of universal health care, an agenda to end racism in our country, an agenda for us to have economic equality. And we believe that if we stand a distance with 10 million, just 10 million in this country, a fraction of the population operating, working in the party, going uh, uh, up in, in races at, at council level, city council, uh, at congressional levels, why is it that the Green Party isn't in Congress? If we can't win the presidency, there are many locations we see that we could strategically win and have a, a Green Party caucus in Congress, in the House, potentially senators. Why has this happened? And so we feel that we need to invest in creating a third party, fully knowing how difficult it might be to ever win the presidency. And why not? As we build, we might actually reach a point to win the presidency or the strategy that we seek to do is to capture both parties. That even if they end up the presidents, that they will have responded to our call fearful of losing because always in the backdrop, there we are, constant, not disappearing after an election, not simply appearing four or five months before a, a presidential election, but that we're always there. And so we are committed to this idea. We, the Green Party, people in the party should be as, as durable as your supermarket, as durable as the stations, healthcare, hospitals, schools, that's where, uh, how permanent we should be. And we should be everywhere. That's where we should be. We should be not just in the swing states. We should have a 50 state strategy. And that will make it so much easier for us to galvanize, to bring in volunteers, to then create a base from which we can fund for justice. Because this has been a real challenge. And so that is our goal. And building in this party will not mean coming out and saying, please vote for me but rather that we mobilize and we bring people from all walks of life, people who have no homes, who know about the struggle. We should put them up for candidacy. They are the best spokespeople, people who have suffered, people from all identity groups. We need a new voice, a new representation, and then we feel people will get excited. We'll hear a message of hope, we'll come into the party and we, and we can attract millions. And that is our goal. And so this is just the beginning. When we show we could defeat with such a small percentage, imagine 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. And then we could turn the tide away from this two-party system and as well capture the two parties as their policies become greener and greener because inevitably they'll discover they can never win without that bulwark of conscience their consent delivered.